This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Do you drive a vehicle? Then you'll find AutoCorrect helpful, especially on Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. Listen to our podcast with me, Coach Charlie Melton, on any podcasting platform or on the MPB Public Media app. From MPB Think Radio, this is Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. They're both chartered financial analysts, and Ryder holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. On Money Talks, we answer your personal finance questions. Today, we're also going to be talking about things that you buy that are wasting your money. The list comes from the Almost Frugal website. You can send an email. The address is money at mpbonline.org. And a reminder that sometimes we can't get to the emails during the show, but Nancy and or Ryder will always respond to your email with whatever your personal finance question is. Uh, Ryder, just a quick thing here. You know, in the introduction, we mentioned that you have the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement for the CFA Institute. And I'm sure we've asked you about this before, (laughs) but remind us, what what exactly is that? Yes. So, well, so, so, it is a, a certificate put out by the CFA Institute. And the CFA charter is they kind of say it's meant to be the gold standard of professionalism and ethics in the financial industry and also kind of the rigor of work. It's kind of well known to be a, a difficult series of tests, long process to get. And it's all focused on investment management, all aspects of investment management from understanding, of course, the ethics and professional uh, and legal responsibilities behind it to uh, the the deep, deep, deep analysis of a company uh, to how that matches up with your end client. And the certificate of investment performance measurement is kind of like that, except really super duper focused on investment performance measurement. So it's all about how different ways you can show performance because sometimes you say you say you have $1000 in an account and it goes up to $1100 at the end of the year and you want to say, "Oh, fantastic. I made $100." Okay. Well, that's uh, we could also say that's uh, 10%. Uh, but we could also look and we could say, well, there were fees taken out or there were there was actually it increased to uh, $1,200 at some point and then it declined or you added money or took money out. And, and you start once you start seeing the different activities and the different transactions which can impact the performance, how do you understand what performance means? And one really interesting uh, thing I saw recently was uh, a an advertisement for a private fund this they were advertising like on Facebook or something this is really inappropriate actually they're advertising they're saying this is a 16% return we're going to invest in real estate is a 16% return and then the other return figure they showed was a 5% return and if uh, i don't you know we, i don't know a lot about math but those two numbers are different and uh, so and it's all about understanding how those were calculated and so one of them was calculated based on you could have a very small amount of money. Say the first dollar you put in, say that has a 16% return. But then the thousand other dollars you put in has a much lower return. Well, it works out under one calculation that, hey, we have a 16% return. Let's advertise that big, bright, bold number. But then if you look what actually happened to your money, you only got a few more dollars. And so we would understand that as a different return. So yes, understanding the complexities of the world of uh, returns, how to understand them and uh, what they mean when you see them. And Kevin, he's really soft selling his uh, skills here because he is quite a math with wizard. Uh, that's his degree. And um, you have to be well versed in math to understand and get that certificate. And uh, CFA members are um, required to report a certain way those returns because using different calculations, as Ryder explained, can be quite misleading to investors. Mm-hmm. This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. As always, we're looking for your personal finance questions this morning. We're going to be talking about some things that uh, the Kind of Frugal website says you're wasting your money on. Uh, But we always like to start the show with financial news in the news. Nancy, we'll give you first shot. 
Oh, my goodness, Kevin. Anybody knows me knows that I do not like Jim Cramer. I mean, all of that yelling on TV and hitting that bell. And, you know, he's wrong so much of the time. And yet he's still out there. One of his famous calls was in 2008 when Bear Stearns was imploding. And he's telling he's beating the, the table. He's ringing that bell by Bear Stearns. And somehow he survived that and he's still out there. Well, there is an exchange traded fund that tracks his recommendations. And guess what? Yesterday, I got a notice that it's closing. Um, meanwhile, the other exchange-traded fund that always does the opposite of whatever he says is still open. That's incredible. <laughs> that's incredible. That, that's embarrassing is what that is. <laughs> but he's still out there. I wonder I wonder if he, uh, he receives any licensing fees from uh, either, one, or either one of those. You know, so he kind of that would be the ultimate trade of Jim Cramer is to profit from people saying that he's wrong as well, (laughs) which I don't know. I mean, that might create some bad incentives. Right. So he just wants to be wrong more often now just so he can make more money on that licensing. I don't know. Kevin, we need a bell. Yeah, okay. yeah, we need a bell, and we need to shout more. We just need to be loud and wrong. <laughs> that's that's easy to do. So that all right, we'll work on that bell though. So, uh, Ryder, what's on your mind this week? Uh, nothing quite so exciting as the uh, inverse Jim Cramer fund, the expression of your personal views through investing. I was looking at one of the numbers that comes out uh, came out today was numbers about housing uh, sales inventory. And I was also kind of comparing that to rental vacancies. We're, and this is, this is nothing new. We're at a time when there are not enough houses and there's a lot of demand for housing. And rental vacancies are down to the same similar levels that they were in the 70s and 80s. They have not been this low in a very long time. So people, you know, if there are rentals out there, they're going to be occupied real soon. Um, Housing typically into the summer does drop off a little bit, and that was kind of expected. Uh, but the the housing inventory is still much lower, so that's the number of houses available to sell still much lower than it was last summer. Uh, we have heard, of course, in some especially larger, uh, hotter metro areas that prices have come down a little bit, but still broadly, housing market is very strong. And so we've heard about uh, home builders uh, are are you know they're they're moving houses and they they are trying to build more and more but it's all it's it's all this story of it it got very got a lot more expensive to build houses interest rates went up and it was a lot harder to buy houses all of these factors are just are just putting some crunch on that but Ryder, uh, mortgage rates have gone up, and we're, we're bumping know. up around 7%, and we thought this was going to slow things down, and you're telling me it's not? Well, so with home builders, so what the houses that are selling, and this is a little more anecdotally, the houses that are selling are typically new built houses, because home builders, they build, the, their entire thing is building houses and selling them. So they are incentivized to kind of cut special deals, to help people pay down their rate a little bit more. And that's one of the things that we hear from uh, realtors is one kind of attractive option for folks is the seller to pay down somebody's mortgage a little bit to reduce their mortgage by a percent for the first year, for instance, in the hopes that the, the buyer will think, OK, great, that means I can refinance in the future. I get a little bit of savings in this first year. So home builders are very good at doing that. Uh, the existing houses. So I don't know, used houses. Is that what we call them these days? the classics, the vintage houses, um, previously, owned. previously owned houses, those are harder to move because that's like me selling my house. I just have less financial firepower to help somebody who's buying my house. I don't have all the creativity and the tools and the financial backing that a large home builder might have. So and also another thing is a lot of houses with the avail- – so again, I mentioned the low vacancy rate. So it's easier to rent your house out, which means, again, if somebody's looking for a house and someone decides to rent instead of list it, that's one less house that is available for you to buy. Uh, so I think one of the things we talked about earlier was – 
new home buyers are the people buying existing houses because they just they just need a place to live. Uh, and then the houses that are moving the quickest are the new houses. But the fact is, there's just not as much on the market, even kind of despite the interest rates. I, I don't know that that's necessarily a huge factor there. Um, but yeah, so it's it's just an interesting dynamic there. I, I think the biggest story is there's just not that much on the market, and that's contributing to the rise in price. The, the interest rates are just a whole nother story as far as affordability goes. You're listening to Money Talks. Our website, moneytalks.mpbonline.org, is one way to hear past broadcasts. You can also download the MPB Public Media app for your smartphone. Then you get to hear all of the local MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotter Janderson, president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. Nancy and Ryder, ready to answer personal finance questions this morning. In addition to your questions today, we're talking about things that you buy that waste money, according to the Almost Frugal website. Email the show by sending it to money at mpbonline.org. If you have any money saving tips that you'd like to share, we'd certainly like to hear those this morning as well. And again, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but one of the things I like about these lists I find on the internet is that some of them seem a little bit more reasonable than others. So it's always to me kind of fun to kind of figure out why it was put on a list and, and whether we agree with it or not. So without any further ado, uh, the first one on the list is paper products, and they said that paying for things that wind up in the trash after one use isn't the best use of your money. So I'll throw this one open. Any thoughts on that, uh, Nancy? What do you think? Well, I do like my paper towels. I have to confess <laughs> I do, but I do keep dish towels uh, on hand uh, in addition to that to help with those things. Um, but you know, I, I guess maybe I feel a little bit better about paper that can be recycled, possibly. Uh, Ryder, what do you think? So I, I think a good general rule is kind of, the, so paper products, the whole thing about them is convenience. And people are willing to pay for convenience, but you certainly can go too far. So you mentioned having regular dish towels on hand. So you have some dish towels you might use to dry some dishes. You might have some towels or some cloths that you use to wipe the table, clean up messes, etc. And so having those is is great like you're not going to spend more money on on those things really you, you rinse them out you throw them in the wash whatever you do with them um but having some paper towels or what i mean we seem to be focusing on paper towels here but having some for convenience when you need them is great using them all of the time and spending a lot of money on paper products that's where it might be okay you can look at this and say what is the real value that i'm getting out of this because again if you are getting a lot of value out of that convenience if that is saving you so much time and so much energy during the day then by gosh spend that dollar 25 on that roll of paper towels you really did something. But if it's just the case where you, you're just using a ton and blowing through them, you, know, you just look at your habits and kind of know where at what point is it have, have I gone beyond convenience? Am I just being, I don't want to say people are just being lazy, but am I, have I gone beyond convenience and I just haven't given myself other options, I think is well, a way of looking at it. In business, too, we um, we used to use more paper. We Everything was printed out on paper. And of course, the guys in my office always laugh at me that I will print out a digital file and have it in my hands. <laughs> Let me tell you how um, shredding works in our office. Um, we will we will look at some notes and we'll say, we need to shred these notes. So we print them up and then we take them to the shredder and we shred them. That's how shredding works in yeah. our office. <laughs> yeah. But but we do use a whole lot less paper. We have um, mm -hmm. electronic files. And so that has cut down on a lot of that usage, um, and even in a home office, uh, you are mm -hmm. then keeping electronic files of all of those things, so you don't need as much of that paper as you used to. And I think one, when you mention an office, the thing about using less paper, and sometimes it's a matter of forcing yourself to use less paper, is that when you have paper and when you rely on paper processes, again, a great backup uh, sometimes is super necessary. We Every now and then we do need a what's called a wet signature and you got to have that on paper but uh, 
you will also be spending on printers and maintaining those printers and ink and scanners and things like that. So if you kind of force yourself to do less paper, then maybe you're spending less on printers and scanners and things like that. Uh, maybe you're getting a more efficient workflow and kind of saving time and effort in all sorts of other ways. So it can be it's great that you mentioned that in an office setting. It's actually a lot more than just what is the cost of that single piece of paper there. All right, let me weigh in. I'm, I'm a big paper towel fan, but I justify that by... Oh, join the club here, Kevin. I, I use it as a paper towel, as a napkin, as a scrubber, yeah. as a dish towel, so I feel... Do you do that all with a single one? Do you, yes. Do you, <laughs> you scrub the dishes and then you wipe, That's exactly wipe the crumbs right. from your mouth? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you chuck it on top of the dishwasher, and you was like, you forget what it was there for. You pick it up, and you use it again. I mean, you know. Uh, also, the other interesting thing, too, is in the broadcasting world, having a physical script in your hand, paper, you know, with printed words on it versus reading something off of a computer screen, that's an interesting uh, change. But I still, I guess I'm a little bit old school because I do like to have the paper in front of me as opposed to trying to read something off of a screen. This is Money Talks. We're looking for your personal finance questions this morning as we go through some things that the kind of frugal website thinks wastes your money. We do have a caller on the line. So let's go to Raleigh and say good morning to Katie, who's called in today. Good morning. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Uh, Good morning. Um, I have a question about bank health. And we are looking to set up a savings account. And as we look at websites that compare banks, like bank rate and um, deposit accounts, we've come across something called a health grade. And we've also seen lately in the news a, that list of banks that down, was downgraded by Fitch and a list of more banks that they seem concerned about. But I... I don't really know how to incorporate that information in our choice of a bank. Um, like if one bank is, is rated B plus and the other is A plus, do, is that really, is that something we need to con- consider? Uh, So that's a very interesting question. And just to kind of go back and look at what all has happened in the banking world this year, there were a handful of high profile, very, uh, I'm not gonna say very large, they weren't the largest, but there were there are quite large bank uh, failures early on in the year. One thing to keep in mind with any of your smaller banks, maybe a lower rated bank, if the bank is if it's if it's a truly a bank in the United States, it is most likely uh, FDIC insured. You can go check on the FDIC website if you don't believe what they're telling you there. But generally speaking, banks are FDIC insured, and you get. Uh, believe it is a quarter million dollars of deposit insurance uh, per depositor per account type. There are a couple ways. If you have over a quarter million dollars of cash in the bank, one, is that the best place for your money? Uh, But two, yes, you can structure your accounts in such a way that you may receive more deposit insurance. Um, As far as the health goes, obviously, even if you have that FDIC protection, you don't want your bank to go under because that might be a bit of a hassle. You might have to change account number if the bank collapsed. You probably move to a different bank. Uh, that that would mean you probably have a new account number, need to reset all your auto pays and things like that. Plus, there might be a couple of days where you can't access your money. But what we did see in the beginning of the year is the FDIC process is very good, quick, and efficient. Basically, I I believe with all of those, everyone got all their money back. Everyone got it back really quickly. It was like a bank would fail on a Friday and it would reopen on Monday in the FDIC's care, for instance. Um, As far as the health goes, I I don't know how much an individual depositor who's keeping less than a quarter million, again, per depositor, per account type, really needs to worry about that. I I think more important, because there's so many banks, while there are failures, they are fairly fairly rare. Um, And again, the recovery process we've seen is is pretty good. So uh, even if there were a large amount of failures, I think most people would be one, protected, and two, not really that inconvenienced. I think one of the biggest factors 
truly is what is the service you're getting from that bank? You know, can't do you have a reliable access to online services? Do you have reliable access to uh, telephone banking if, if you're not you know as comfortable uh, with the online app? Because if it's a small bank and you're not near them, you might have trouble doing something. You just need that service. Uh, how quickly can they can you do deposits and withdrawals? Things like that. What are the services you're getting from that bank is going to be a lot more important. What we did see is a lot of people went and just opened up accounts at some of the largest banks, so the Chase, Citibank, Bank of America, just because there's uh, more familiarity and comfort in the size of those banks. Um, Mm -hmm. I I don't think it's a big issue to worry about, even in the event of failure. Again, we've seen quick and efficient uh, and somewhat convenient recoveries for Mm -hmm. folks. So don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shun a local bank that you love or are proud of otherwise. And if you have over 250000 which we find with people who are business people or uh, people who have a lot of CDs, you can simply split those accounts across different banks. So each bank, each account type gives you that 250000 of coverage. And when it comes to certificates of deposit, CDs, some of the larger banks even participate in a consortium so that you can have all of your money, for instance, at Regions, I'll just choose that, as sort of an umbrella, but then they kind of farm that out to different banks so that you get that full FDIC protection. But when all is said and done, when we had these big failures earlier in the year, and that was a problem because much of the deposits at Silicon Valley Bank were business people and were more than 250000 that the uh, government actually stepped in and made them all whole. So I'm with Ryder. You probably don't need to worry about it. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I will say if um, if we... If we had over 250000 we would probably be coming to see you guys. <laughs> so appreciate thank you very much. Thank you. All Bye-bye. right. We're looking for your personal finance questions, but also talking about things that uh, you buy that waste your money, according to the Almost Frugal website. Love that name, by the way. Money Talks is MPB Think Radio's personal finance broadcast. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson, president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. They're both chartered financial analysts, and Ryder holds the Certificate Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. They're ready to answer your personal finance questions this morning, and while we wait for phone calls, we're talking this hour also about things that you buy that might be a waste of money, according to the Almost Frugal website. We do have another caller on the line, so we're going to say good morning to John, who calls in from South Haven. John, you're on the air with us, so go ahead. Okay, thank you for taking my call. I appreciate it very much. I have two questions, if I don't overstay my welcome. (laughs) The first one is about the basis of stock in a joint account with rights of survivorship. My wife and I have an account, and some stock in there has appreciated greatly. Mm -hmm. And if one of us passes away, does the basis reset for the remaining survivor? Uh, Half of it does. Half of it does. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And, and, and I will say as well, so with rights of survivorship broadly, that's the designation. A lot of states use that des- designation. That's what's available. And essentially, whoever the other account owner or owners, you can have multiple joint owners, uh, they have a right to you know, the deceased's share. Uh, whereas there are some other designations, so tenants in common, uh, you can actually in some places designate what percentage share belongs to people and they can designate what happens to that share. It is, it is they have an undivided interest in that account, for instance, because uh, each dollar is kind of the same, but uh, their share is dictated by their will, so it does not necessarily go to the other owners. So there's an important distinction between joint accounts and they and they typically they tend to be titled differently in some different states that can happen all right back to you understand that um we have something called the stepped up cost basis and john you are referencing that which is uh, right now when someone dies that the basis whatever they paid for that stock let's suppose they paid ten dollars a share 
25 years ago, the new basis will be whatever the price was on the day that they died. And so that's a huge advantage for people inheriting stock in that situation. So in a joint tenants with rights of survivorship, the assumption is that half of the account belonged to the person who died, and you get that stepped-up cost basis on that half, but the other half stays where it was. Okay, good, great, thank you. Now, second question. Uh, recently cashed in a good amount of CDs and took a six-month hit on interest uh, to reinvest, which is uh, beneficial to us, but the interest has already been taxed and paid, taxes paid on the interest earned. Can that be a deduction for a person who does not itemize like a business mm. loss or you mean what what would you be thinking of the deduction is the tax you've already paid uh the interest as a loss since uh we dropped uh, like three thousand dollars worth of interest income and so but did you that, pay a penalty for for taking them out correct that was a six-month penalty yes all right so that just reduced the amount of interest that you earned for the year correct yes so did it reduce it enough to cover the full penalty? Uh, In other that, words, you earned interest, and then a lot of it got wiped out because of the penalty. Yes, that's correct. We had eight months of interest. Six months was lost. So we had okay, two months so, interest left. So in other words, you should only have on your 1099 the net of that. Okay, good. I'll wait for that then, and I'll quit worrying about it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you all. I appreciate your help. All right, John, Thank you. thanks for the phone call. You can email the show by sending it to money at mpbonline.org. So we have a list of things that uh, the Almost Frugal website says you probably are wasting your money on and urge you to stop buying them. The next one is an interesting one. It says non-sale items, and the thought is that things that you use daily are probably on sale somewhere if you have multiple stores nearby. My first thought is... If you run all across town trying to find a sale on soap or toothpaste, perhaps you're using more money in gas With than gas you prices would these saving. days. I mean, come on. <laughs> what are we suggesting here? Um, and and if you use these are products that you use daily, uh, uh, can you really wait? We're back to convenience here. Yeah. Oh yeah, just just go three days without toothpaste, and somebody <laughs> call in. <laughs> Cover your mouth, but call in when you. Yeah, we don't want to know about that. I, I, I think I one of the about that soap. <laughs> <laughs> one of the more diapers is on this list. My gosh, um, how do you go without that, right? Oh, it just, it's uh, difficult. I'll say that. Um, so I, I think one of the kind of bigger, broader things to think about here is, uh, and, and we say this often, is saving saving money is a habit. And so when you look at your expenses, you, you, you need to kind of train yourself, teach yourself to be a better consumer, to spend more in ways that are aligned with the things you want. Because kind of like we talked about with the paper products, like there is some level of convenience and value that you're get, getting out of those paper products. And you need to kind of find where that level is. OK, there's going to be some level of convenience and value and importance of having a bar of soap or whatever your favorite soap uh, medium is these days available for you. There's going to be some level of that. So reflect on your purchases after you make them. So just, just take well, a moment and reflect on your purchase and say, is this something that I needed? Is this something I appreciate? Is this something I'm going to use? Well, we don't have to judge ourselves. Just reflect on it. So you get into the habit of thinking, okay, I'm going to really start focusing. Oh, this was more important. Oh, this was, that's, this is how I need to be shopping. Um, and also planning ahead with a lot of these things. It is, okay, we're looking for sales on our soap and our toothpaste and things like that. Well, plan ahead a little bit. Uh, if you, one thing that really gets to these things, a lot of these things are kind of smaller expenses we're thinking of. It's just super easy to keep running your card every time. And sometimes, oh, I don't want to run my card for $2. I'll throw in an extra product. Um, is being a little more deliberate about when and where you shop. So say, okay, well, I'm going to do all of my making a shopping list. I'm going to do that all on Sunday afternoon. And then I'm going to do all of my shopping on Tuesday and just 
limiting the times that you are actively spending. So again, getting into the process, getting into the habit of thinking a little, just just a little bit more about those expenses, thinking just a little bit more about them. And maybe you still make the same uh, purchases, but you're doing them kind of all at once. It's a little less just, oh, I'm a person who is always running my card. And now it's, I'm a person who has a plan and who has the discipline to know to get these things on these days. Well, you know, at my house, the planning ahead, uh, we have two different approaches here, which is uh, <laughs> my husband uses the last of the milk and then puts the empty carton back and then opens the fridge and says, oh, we're out of milk. <laughs> um, me, I'm, I'm down to the last third. We need to get some more milk. Um, so make sure you are on y- yes. sync there with each other. And uh, <laughs> because when you get caught with something that you really need, that's when you run to the local convenience store. Absolutely. Because that's the, the closest thing yeah. you can get to and you got to have it then. And, and it's not just that, oh, you paid 50 cents more for milk, but you spent 30 minutes of your day that you just, we were at the grocery store just yesterday. Why didn't we think of this? Um, that's a really good point. If you have a spouse or a, uh, a spending partner of any sort, that's someone who can kind of hold you accountable and can think things through. Uh, just the other day, we were at the grocery store, uh, my wife and I, and there were several things that were on the list. I was like, oh, we actually have this. We don't need that. And there's something I put on the list. And she said, well, why don't we use this as a substitute? I know we have this. So having just someone to kind of go through, and, and it wasn't a matter of, oh, we desperately need to save, again, this dollar fifty, But one, we need to use the things we already have. That's important. We've already spent some of this money. Uh, but also, it's just making us more efficient. We don't want to spend two hours in the grocery store tracking down every tiny thing. If we have a substitute for something, great. We can use that and we can keep it rolling. And also, I would say also, you know, as the toothpaste tube gets to be below half, then you start looking for toothpaste on sale. In below your half, you can crank out, you can crank out toothpaste <laughs> well after the whole thing is empty. Well, I'm I, saying, come okay. on now. All right. So here, here's the argument in my house. I squeeze from the middle. Oh. Yeah. And yeah. And my husband is just like, he's very meticulous. It rolls from the top and it drives him crazy. So we have to have separate That's really interesting because I was definitely agreeing with you on the milk purchase, but I'm agreeing with him (laughs) on the toothpaste purchase. Mm -hmm. So this is very interesting. But I'm saying is it gets below 50 percent, don't necessarily, but keep an eye. That's one of the things that you would say, aha, on sale, we're about to run out of toothpaste. I need some more. So, hey, we got another caller on the line. We're going to go this time to Clinton. James has called in today. Good morning, James. You're on the air with us. So go ahead. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, My question involves a a living trust. Uh, In 2013, my wife and I set up a trust for my daughter. And my wife died in 2016. And my question is, uh, is there anything I need to do legally to change the the trust? It's it's still the the mm. trust involves stocks and yeah. bonds and uh, and I and I'm just wondering, is there anything I should do before I die? <laughs> Probably not. But if you go back and uh, pull out that document, because most of the time when a couple creates a living trust, there are provisions um, for when one passes away. And so even though the name of the trust may still be in both names, there is a surviving trustee and everything flows through like that. Since it has been a while and there may have been some changes in the law, you might just want to take that document to a local attorney and let that person look it over and make sure there's nothing in that language there that is opposed to current law, nothing that needs to be changed, because certainly um, doing an amendment now that makes it easier for your heirs is better than waiting uh, till later. But just go get it checked out, but you are probably fine. Uh, one. 
Yeah, one important thing I would say, and this is a very classic mistake, I think Nancy mentioned it last week, is that when you get a trust made, uh, including a revocable, a revocable living trust is make sure you title things in the name of the trust. The trust is just a, it's a structure. It's a, it's a, it's a document. It's a box. It describes how things in that box should be treated. If you don't put all of your things in that box, it's not going to do anything. So uh, when you get a trust, if you have ass, uh, stock accounts, uh, bank accounts, put them in the name of the trust. Uh, many people also homes and vehicles, put them in the name of the trust. Typically, like Nancy said, not a lot of changes need to be made because the trust is designed to be a structure, an entity that can survive on. The trust names a trustee, as you pointed out, and that trustee is the one with the authority to make all the changes and sign all the things. Uh, So if things were not, if if you've acquired anything or or forgotten to title anything in the name of the trust, uh, now is a great time to do that. Um, Also, uh, letting your daughter know how this works. I'm assuming uh, if, if this is not like a special needs trust, then if she is going to be the trustee or she needs to know kind of what your other wishes are, then that's going to be important. Um, one change, Nancy, you know, alluded to there may be some legal changes that affect how you want to have your trust set up. One big change that we sometimes see is when people have the trust as a beneficiary of their IRAs. You, you don't title your IRA in the name of the trust, but you can have it as a beneficiary. Not a huge fan, but sometimes for asset protection reasons, someone may do that, or sometimes people may do that so that their children can't change the beneficiaries again. And it's every situation is unique there, but some trusts used to reference an old way of taking withdrawals out of accounts Uh, and there could be a pretty big conflict with the new way withdrawals are made that is they now withdrawals have to be made over 10 years instead of over that person's lifetime so if the trust references an old method of making withdrawals there could be some problems there Uh, that is one thing that springs to mind that we we always do want to check when we see that as a beneficiary but um, yeah that that's that's some things to watch for the the withdrawal set up, I believe, involves the fact that she could only take out half of the trust at my death and then receive the other over a period of time. Has that changed? That should that should be the same because you're talking about um, all of your assets. But what Ryder was referencing is there are different rules for retirement accounts. And so I would say go back and and look at what's a retirement account and the withdrawal from those retirement accounts, whether it goes to her directly or whether it has to go through the trust where it then can be distributed to her. And that's where an attorney can talk to you about what your wishes are. Yeah. And Uh, and, oh, go ahead. Well, the the others, uh, well, I'm sorry, I forgot what I was going to ask. <laughs> I'm sorry for interrupting. I just, no, that's okay. What, so just one other thing to think about is sometimes people will say, well, actually, this trust is no longer necessary. So trusts are a great tool. And the and the fact that they have just a kind of a named trustee, there's just kind of a continuation. When you die, there's someone else is the trustee. There's a continued kind of management or oversight of those accounts. There's no kind of lag period where a couple of weeks where people are trying to scramble to get everything together again. It's already titled there. It's already named the trustee. We're good to go there. It's a great tool, but think about the original purpose that you set it up for. Maybe your daughter was... Uh, 15 years old at the time and you you didn't want her to receive all this money at at one time it's been 10 years she's 25 maybe she's financially responsible you're like goodness gracious if she got all this money at once it wouldn't be a problem for her uh sometimes people have more children and they need to think about that and and so 
if your beneficiary situation has changed or also the tax laws. Uh, 2013, we actually still had our pretty generous estate exemptions, but prior to that, a lot of older trusts we see were created to avoid uh, estate taxes or to help manage estate taxes at a time when the estate exemption was like, I, I don't even know what it was. It was like a million dollars. It's $24 million right now or something around that for a married couple. It's about like $12, $13 million a piece. Uh, we do anticipate that going down. So again, there's going to be some room for trust planning there in a certain asset range. But for a lot of people, especially a simple beneficiary situation, you're passing it on to uh, a, a single adult child, then it, the, the use of it is not, it's just not what it used to be. And let's uh, be clear with our listeners that a revocable trust is not going to save you on estate Correct. taxes, even if you had that larger amount. Um, what most people get sold on with a revocable or living trust is, oh, you avoid probate. Well, you do, but in Mississippi, probate is really not that big of a deal. So that's not really the reason you would set up a trust like that. But uh, what this uh, caller is talking about is being able to control from the grave, is the way we say it, uh, how that money is distributed. And that may be one reason you want to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, James, thanks for your call. If you uh, have any further questions, you can always email the show as well. Send it to money at mpbonline.org. We're pleased you found our show, Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lottridge-Anderson, president of New Perspectives and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. Now, we talked about non-sale items and that you should search around looking for, you know, things uh, that are sales. We talked about things that are usually on sale. The next one on the list is sale items that you don't need. The thought is a bargain isn't a bargain if you purchase something that you don't need or wouldn't otherwise buy. Is that maybe part of the reason why a sale is ever made to entice someone to buy something they might not normally buy? Oh, my God. 50% off. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm probably guilty of this more than anybody because it just is like, oh, wow, I could probably use this sometime. I'm getting a little bit better at, okay, let me just – Give Step back and think and about the, this. Yeah, I need to think about it. Maybe the sale goes on for a few days. I'll come back. Uh, where I get really caught is if I go into these like little antique consignment shops, and I'm thinking, if I let this go and I come back, it won't be here. It won't here. be here. Oh, no. Somebody here. else will own this precious, unique artifact. Yeah, but I'm getting better because I'm realizing – Kevin, as we are both aging here, uh, writer's not there yet, of all the stuff that's accumulating that no one else wants. So what's going to happen to all that junk? Uh, Yes, Kevin, as we've stated before, sales, they are not actually charitable events that stores hold. They are profitable events that stores hold. They are designed to get you to spend money. That Let's keep in mind, coupons are marketing and advertising. Sales are also. Um, I, I think the, the just the planning ahead is, is a great way to, to approach any of these, but particularly with sales. Uh, if you are going to a place, you see something on sale, look, if it's not on your list and you cannot you know, clearly state this is how and when and where I will use this, eh, then that's probably not going to be a worthwhile purchase. You know, sometimes you do see things and you say, okay, well, you know, I was planning on uh, replacing this set of pots and pans later this year. I can go ahead and do that because I can state clearly I'm going to replace my pots and pans with these pots and pans that I'm purchasing. This is actually a genuinely good price. And it is actually something that I was just because it wasn't actually penciled in on my list doesn't mean it's a hard no. Um, but, but be clear and intentional with what you're going to use it for and what you came into the store for. And I agree with Nancy. Take a deep breath because, again, they're putting it on sale to get you excited to uh, make a decision that might not be your best. Shoes, Kevin. Shoes. <laughs> That's going to wrap us up for today. Money Talks is a production of MPB Think Radio, funded in part by generous financial support from listeners. To hear today's show or previous show, you can visit moneytalks.mpbonline.org or listen to the podcast by searching for Money Talks. For Dr. Nancy Lottridge Anderson and Ryder Taff, I'm Kevin Farrell, inviting you to join us every Tuesday at 9 for Money Talks. It's heard only on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. 
To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.